serve. I'm the uh, Ann Administrative Proxy from Massachusetts. Uh, I am joined up front by Max Appleman, the FMP coordinator, as well as Dr. Kristen Anstead and Dr. Katie Drew, uh, who will all be helping us through some of the agenda items today. Our first order of business is the uh, to approve the agenda. Are there any suggested changes to the agenda? Seeing none, the agenda will be considered approved as presented. Up next is the approval of the proceedings from our November 13 and 14, 2017 meeting. They were a whopping 127 pages. Are there any changes, uh, suggested changes to the proceedings? Seeing none, the minutes will be considered approved. Our next item is public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items, menhated related items that are not on the agenda. Uh, Max has provided me a sign-in sheet. Um, no one has signed in, but I'll look quickly to the audience to make sure there is nobody that would like to comment on an item not on the agenda. Seeing no hands, we will move on to, um, we have three separate action items all pertaining to the 2019 benchmark stock assessment and peer review for Menhaden, of which there are two tracks, the benchmark, uh, the single species benchmark assessment as well as the ecosystem based benchmark stock assessment. Uh, the process for these assessments is well underway. The data workshops um, occurred last week uh, for, for both assessments. And uh, I'll now turn to Kristen uh, for our first item, which is to review and consider approval of the terms of reference for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Single Species Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review. Kristen? Thank you, and good morning. Uh, I'm about to go through the terms of reference for the single species benchmark stock assessment, but first I thought I would just talk briefly about the process that's underway. We have two parallel tracks for this overall benchmark assessment. We have our single species and we have our ERP and they will be two separate reports that we're moving along together. We have several people on that are overlap on both of these committees and we have, uh, as we've started this process, been conscious of workloads and energy spent for each of these two separate reports. Um, the overlap is intentional so that we are communicating with each other throughout this process uh, as well as focusing on if somebody on one committee is doing a lot of analysis for one assessment that they have more of a tracking role on the other. So that's been part of the process to balance workload as well as maintain the communication between the two. Uh, these are really supporting models for each other so they will be proceeding with different um, uh, goals, but ultimately the goal is the same and to compare them and keep them together is certainly one of our overall goals. We have had our data workshop last week, so in the spirit of that, the first half of the data workshop was for the single species benchmark assessment where we looked at fishery independent data, landings, talked about the BAM model as well as some recommendations that came out of that update in 2017 and some of the changes we'd like to make to data and then the second half of the week was the ERP workshop. Uh, my main focus is the benchmark so I'm going to go through the TORs and then Katie Drew is uh, working mainly on ERP. Uh, the timeline in general, we had, as I said, we had our data workshop last week where we evaluated data and we'll be working over the next several months uh, on that data. We have another in-person workshop in September and there'll be following workshops in 20. 19. We are scheduled to go to peer review with both of these reports in tandem with the same peer review panel in December 2019 and uh, with the intention of presenting it to the board uh, February 2020, uh, both of those assessments as well as the peer review reports. Uh, these assessments share a lot of data, so some data that's being developed as part of the single species will be used in the ERP assessment, uh, and so that's something else to keep in mind as we go through this, that these two assessments are really entwined with each other. 
So I'm going to go through the benchmark TORs now. Uh, as a stock assessment subcommittee, or SAS, last week we reviewed the TORs and did make some changes, and you may have noticed that between your meeting materials and what's in front of you as a handout today. So I'm going to go through the benchmark, and then I will pause and we can talk about it, and then Katie will go through the ERP TORs because they are slightly different. So our first TOR is uh, a pretty standard one that we have for many of our assessments, which is to define the population structure based on available data. So we'll go to the literature, we'll look at the data that we have, and make some recommendations about population structure as it's used in the models. Our second one is our climate change TOR to evaluate new information on life history, such as growth rates, size of maturation, natural mortality rate, and migrations, and review the potential impacts of environmental change on these characteristics. This is a modification coming out of the recommended TORs from the climate change work group that you all heard from, I think, last year. Our third TOR is to characterize the precision and accuracy of fishery-dependent and independent data used in the assessment. And then there's uh, following sub-bullets, uh, which are to provide descriptions of each data source, describe calculation and potential standardization of abundance indices, discuss trends and associate estimates of uncertainty, justify inclusion or elimination of available data sources, and discuss the effects of data strengths and weaknesses. Our fourth TOR is to develop models used to estimate population parameters and biological reference points and analyze model performance. So this will be to describe the history of the model usage, uh, its theory and framework, and clearly explain its strengths and weaknesses, and justify our choice of CVs, sample sizes, likelihood weighting schemes to discuss the stability of the model and to perform sensitivity analyses, as well as if there were multiple models considered to justify the choice of a preferred model and explain any difference in the results. And we do have a separate TOR that will specifically task us with comparing the output of our single species with the ERP model, but I'll talk about that when we get to that TOR. So this is more if multiple models were considered within the single species. Uh, report to talk about why we chose, for example, the BAM over something else. TOR 5, state assumptions made for all models and explain the likely effects of assumption violations on synthesis of input data and model outputs. Mm -hmm. So this may concern our stock recruitment function, our error in our catch at age or catch at length matrix, our calculation of M and our choice of what we decide to use for natural mortality. Uh, as well as our choice of reference points and a plus group for the age-structured species. TOR 6 is to characterize uncertainty of model estimates and biological or empirical reference points. And TOR 7 is to perform retrospective analyses and assess the magnitude and direction of patterns detected and to discuss what those uh, implications may be. TR8 is to recommend stock status as related to reference points uh, and answer kind of in general, what is, is the stock below the biomass threshold, is F above the threshold? TR9 is to compare the trends in population parameters and reference points with current and proposed modeling approaches, including the results of the ERP benchmark stock assessment, and if they differ, to discover possible causes and observe discrepancies. So this is our TOR that specifically tasks us with discussing if our result is the same or different from the result of the ERP benchmark assessment, and to talk about how the models are different, how they're the same, and how the advice is different or the same. Um, we will be doing this all along the process. Like I said, these use a lot of the same data, they have a lot of the same people, and the timeline is the same. So we will constantly be in contact throughout this process, but we do have this specific TOR that says compare these two report theses to each other and discuss similarities and differences and why they may be that way. TOR 10 is uh, the TOR for a minority report, if we do have one. 
uh, TOR 11 is to make a prioritized list of the research recommendations, uh, specifically focusing on future research, data collection, and assessment methods, and to highlight improvements to be made by the next benchmark. That uh, final sentence has been really helpful in some other benchmarks we've had that uh, state which, TOR, uh, which research recommendations should be completed before you start the next benchmark. That really can give uh, the SAS some guidance on timing. And timing is, in fact, our 12th TOR is to recommend when the uh, single species benchmark should be either updated or a new benchmark should be initiated. We then have our reviewer TORs. Uh, so the first TOR for the reviewers is to evaluate the thoroughness of data collection and the presentation and treatment of our data in the assessment. And so they have a list of different items there to consider, but this one's a very general evaluate how well the data was handled. Two is to evaluate the methods and the models used to estimate population parameters and reference points, and they also have some uh, guidance within that TOR for the choice and justification of the preferred model, uh, if multiple models were considered to evaluate our explanations of the differences, and to talk about uh, model parameterization and specification. The reviewer uh, TOR3 is to evaluate the diagnostic analyses performed, such as the sensitivity or the retrospective analyses. TOR4 is to evaluate the methods used to characterize uncertainty and estimated parameters. Five is to evaluate that minority report if it does in fact exist. And six is to recommend best estimates of stock biomass abundance and exploitation from the assessment for use in management or specify alternative estimation methods. TOR 7 for the reviewers, evaluate the choice of reference points and the methods used to recommend them. And 8 is to review the research, data collection, and assessment method recommendations by the TC and to make any additional ones if they're warranted. Nine, they are also tasked with recommending the timing of the next benchmark. Uh, and then 10 is to prepare their report. Uh, in terms of reference and advisory, summarizing the panel's evaluation of the stock assessment and addressing each peer review term of reference, and to develop a list of tasks to be completed before the next workshop, uh, and to submit that report within four weeks of the workshop conclusion, which will keep us then on target since we have that December uh, peer review and we uh, intend to present it at the February board meeting. So that's why that's there. So with that, I can take any questions about the TORs uh, for the single species benchmark assessment and then we will review the SAS and then Katie Drew will go through the ERP. Thank you, Kristen. Are there questions? Uh, begin with David Blazer, please. Thank you. Um, and I'm trying to recall that this all looks very good. I'm not as technical as a lot of people. Um, but I'm thinking back to, uh, you know, the uh, debates that we've had over the last six to, to nine months. Um, and I'm looking at the reference points that we were evaluating during the last uh, amendment as we were going through. Um, so I recall that a lot of those mortality rates, the estimates kind of fluctuated with each model run that we had. And there was a lot of variability in those numbers that I know for me, it can created some confusion back at that time. Will this stock assessment, you know, will we look at those um, reference points? How are they gonna change with each run um, and how are, is it, how are we going to address that particular issue that we had previously? So the reference points for Amendment 3, are you referencing the ones that were proposed, uh, that kind of suite of different, so for the benchmark assessment, we will be running the BAM and talking about that reference point, so there'll be a bunch of sensitivity around it. Those other ones, I believe, are more are ERP specific and uh, yeah, uh, but we will be doing some sensitivity around ours. And you may recall that the reference points were adjusted slightly during the update. And so if that were to happen again, we will, of course, discuss why they could be the same or different from the update or the 2015 benchmark. Up next, I had John Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a question about the uh, 
environmental change, the climate change uh, part, Kristen, I was just wondering if any of that has been worked out, how you're going to look at that. And I noticed in the uh, peer review, I didn't see anything directly in the peer review that would evaluate how you addressed climate change in the, in the model. There is not a specific TOR for the reviewers to talk about that. It kind of would fall under the umbrella of evaluate the thoroughness of data collection and the use of data. Uh, the SAS did talk at length about the climate change TOR and uh, soften the language a bit to make it not as contentious at peer review as you probably know that currently there's no mechanism or model to fold in climate change, and we just want to be conscientious of can we accomplish what we've set out to. So the language is softened a little bit to still address it, to do a literature review, fold it in where we can. We use environmental data and standardizing indices. We'll be looking at can we build any sort of habitat model off of that climate, uh, the environmental data from uh, the fishery independent surveys. Uh, but if it's not feasible, we didn't want to back ourselves into a corner that we couldn't address that TOR and that would become um, a problem at peer review, but by all means we intend to assess it and evaluate it and fold it in mathematically where we can. John McMurray. Uh, thank you. Um, regarding TOR number eight, recommend stock status as related to reference points if available. For example, is the stock below the biomass threshold? Is F above the threshold? Are we just looking at thresholds or are we not looking at targets also? We do have targets and thresholds. I, this is our standard TOR8. I'm not sure why they only say threshold, but of course we will be having both and be talking about stock status in relation to both of those things. That's uh, already part of it. Any other hands for questions? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. So building a bit off of Dave Blazer's question, um, it strikes me, well, first of all, I was also reminded about our challenge last time in terms of comparing SPR-based analyses with total biomass-based analyses. And it looks to me that TOR9 sort of gets at that, and I'm wondering if that's true and that that's really what's the intent of TOR9, to take different outcomes that are maybe based on different currencies and compare them so that the board has a better ability to compare and contrast. That's certainly the goal. So uh, compare what the reference points mean in relation to each other between the single species and the ERP, what management advice, how these models operated and why that might be different. So it's uh, not specific only to that, but to all of kind of these two different reports to really talk about how they're the same and different and why. Any further questions? Seeing none, uh, we would look for any changes to the terms of reference. Uh, otherwise, uh, a motion from the board to approve the terms of reference for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Single Species Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review would be in order at this time. Uh, Robert Boyles. So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Shree Patterson? Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, are you ready to, to vote on the matter? I'll read the uh, motion uh, one more time. Move to approve the terms of reference for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Single Species Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review. Uh, those in favor, please raise your right hand. Any opposed? Zero. Any null votes or abstentions? The motion carries unanimously, 18-0-0-0. We will move on next to item five, to review and populate the Atlantic Menhaden Stock Assessment Subcommittee membership. Um, again, the, the SAS is specific to the single species assessment, so I'll turn back to Kristen for a quick uh, overview of this. Thank you. I just have one slide 
on this with our current stock assessment subcommittee membership. This is what we operated under last week for our data workshop, but we do need it to be approved officially by you all. Um, Amy Schuler was our chair through the uh, CDAR 2015 as well as the update, and she remains our chair and uh, the uh, lead modeler. Uh, she runs the BAM model. Uh, Joey Ballinger is now our TC chair, so the TC chair does sit on the SAS to provide that bridge to the TC. Uh, we have Matt Sieri from Maine, Micah Dean from Mass, Rob Latour from VIMS, Chris Swanson from Florida, and he's replacing Bezod, uh, Jason McNamee in Rhode Island, uh, Ray Marock, uh, also in the NIMPS Beaufort lab uh, where Amy's from, uh, Jeff Brust from New Jersey, Alexi Sherov from Maryland, and then the three of us on staff. Any questions about the membership of the SAS? Seeing none, uh, if there are no suggested changes, we'd be looking for a motion to approve the membership of the SAS for the 2019 assessment. Shri Patterson. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second to the motion? Uh, Roy Miller, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? If you're ready to call the question, I'll read it one more time. Move to approve the Atlantic Menhaden Stock Assessment Subcommittee membership. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Eighteen. Uh, any uh, opposition? Null votes. Abstentions. Seeing none, the motion carries. Eighteen zero zero zero. Uh, we'll move on to number six, and uh, we'll be looking to review and consider approval of the terms of reference for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Ecosystem-Based Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review, and for this we'll turn to Katie Drew. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so I will be going over the terms of reference for the ERP assessment, which has sort of its own uh, TORs in order to focus on what we want to be reviewed on and evaluated on for this particular assessment. And so there are some differences between um, what we're going to be talking about for the single species and what we're looking at for the ERP assessment. So I'm going to start out with the assessment terms of reference. This is for the ERP work group to accomplish. TOR number one is going to be review and evaluate the fishery dependent and fishery independent data used in the Menhaden single species assessment and justify the inclusion, elimination, or modification of those data sets. So this is our first big difference is we're going to be building on the work that the Menhaden TC does to um, develop, review, and evaluate the Menhaden specific data so that we don't duplicate their efforts. We're going to take the work that they do in pre preparing that Menhaden specific data that we need for our models, um, make sure that it fits and lines up with our models and basically just justify why we're using or why we're not using their data rather than duplicate their efforts. We will be spending more time on TOR number two, which is to characterize the precision and accuracy of additional fishery dependent and fishery independent data sets, including the diet data, um, that we're going to be used in the ecological reference point models. And so this is where we're going to get into more of the detailed data work, um, like providing the descriptions of the data sources, describing the calculation and standardization of any indices, um, the trends and the uncertainty, and justifying the inclusion or elimination of these data sources, as well is talking about the specific strengths and weaknesses of these sort of non-Menhaden or non-Menhaden single species data sets. Number three is uh, to develop models used to estimate population parameters such as F, biomass, and abundance of Atlantic Menhaden that take into account Menhaden's role as a forage fish. So this is kind of the really the specific TOR that gets at what is the ERP doing that's different from the single species assessment. Um, so develop these models as well as analyzing the model performance. And that includes things like making sure that we document the history of the model usage, um, the theory in the framework, um, test it with simulated data if it's a new model. Um, justify the choice of ecological factors, um, such as predator and prey species or environmental factors that will be going into these models. Um, describing the stability of the models, justifying the parameterization of the models as appropriate for each model. That The models that we're looking at for the ERP workgroup range extremely in terms of complexity, in terms of theory and framework, and so we want to make sure that we're doing this appropriately for each model. <laughs> 
as well as performing sensitivity analyses, model diagnostics, um, and explaining the model's strengths and weaknesses, including each model's capacity to account for environmental changes. Um, <clears throat> Number four, I think, is probably the key term of reference for this entire assessment, which is to develop methods to determine reference points and total allowable catch for Atlantic menhaden that account for Atlantic menhaden's role as a forage fish. So I think this is what the ERP work group sees as sort of the core um, purpose of this assessment. And so this gets its own specific TOR. And I think the key here is that we are developing the methods to create these reference points and create these quotas, but it'll be up to the board to finally to settle on the final value after evaluating the trade-offs between these different models and between the different assumptions um, in these models. Uh, number five is state assumptions made for all population and reference point models um, and explain the effects of assumption violations on input data and model output. So this is kind of making sure that as we talk about these models, we can explain um, what we have to assume, what we know through data, and how that's going to affect our final perception of stock status and of appropriate reference points. And if that's really tied to number six, which is characterize the uncertainty of these model estimates and these reference points um, as appropriate for each model so that we can tell you kind of how certain we are about these reference points and about the information coming out of these models. Uh, number seven is evaluate stock status for Atlantic Menhaden from the recommended models as related to the reference points if available. Um, so again, this is kind of no, um, recognizing that we're going to be presenting sort of a suite of models that have different strengths and weaknesses and that give the board um, different information related to their management objectives of Menhaden. Um, and so it'll be up to the board to make the final choice about reference points, uh, but we'll provide the stock status relative to each of those reference points so the board can kind of understand what each model is telling you. And number eight is similar to what was in the single species method, that is to compare the trends in population parameters and reference points among the proposed modeling approaches, including the results of the single species benchmark assessment. Um, and so if the outcomes differ, then discuss the potential causes of observed discrepancies. So again, this is the mirror term of reference for the si single species model, where we'll be comparing the output of our models, not just to the multi-species models, not just to the ERP models, but also to the single species model to really put these numbers in context of both the single species and the multi-species framework. And then 9, 10, and 11 are, these are almost identical to the single species. Basically, if a minority report has been filed, um, deal with that. So explain the majority reasoning um, and make sure that that's all explained develop the short and long-term prioritized lists and recommendations for future research and highlight improvements to be made by the next benchmark review, recommend the timing of the next benchmark assessment and intermediate updates if necessary relative to the biology and current management of the species. And for the ERP group, this will also include taking into account the timeline of benchmarks and updates for our predator and alternative prey species as well as what the Menhaden board specifically needs in terms of management. So that's it for the uh, ERP assessment terms of reference. This is what the work group will be working off of. Um, I will next go briefly over the review panel terms of reference. Um, so basically the main difference is that instead of doing the work, they have to evaluate our work. So they will have to evaluate the justification that we use to include or not include or modify any of the single species data. Uh, they will evaluate the thoroughness of our data collection and treatment um, for additional fishery dependent and independent data um, that is not part of the Menhaden single species assessment. And they will evaluate the methods and the models that we use to estimate those parameters that take into account um, the role as the forage fish, including evaluating the model choice and the justification of the recommended models um, and evaluating explanation of differences in results as well as you know the model parameterization <clears throat> and and how we set up those models to make sure those are the most appropriate ways to handle that data number four is to evaluate the methods used to estimate reference points and total allowable catch again this gets a um, a specific term of reference for itself because of the importance to this assessment um, and it's really making sure that the methods that we've used to develop these reference points are appropriate <clears throat> 
they will also evaluate our diagnostic analyses, so the sensitivity analyses, the retrospective analyses as appropriate for each of the models that we are working with in the ERP group, and evaluate the methods that we use to characterize the uncertainty in our estimates and make sure that those implications of that uncertainty is clearly stated, that we're upfront and honest about the uncertainty in these assessments. Number seven is basically if a minority report has been filed, then make sure you review it and give us your opinion on this minority report. And then number eight is to recommend the best estimates of stock biomass, abundance, exploitation, and stock status of Atlantic Menhaden from the assessment for use in management if possible, or specify alternative estimation methods. So this is basically gives the review panel the chance to weigh in on this and say, here's the best out of what you've done. And if, you, and if none of them work, then will you recommend instead? Um, so then number nine is to review the assessment methodology, um, the, research uh, sorry, the research recommendations for data collection and, re and assessment methodology, um, and make additional recommendations as warranted, and prioritize what is needed to inform the next benchmark assessment, as well as to recommend the timing of the next benchmark assessment and updates if necessary. And then finally, prepare a, t uh, a peer review pa panel um, report that basically summarizes everything that they have done. Um, and complete and submit that report within four weeks of the workshop conclusion. So that's it for the ERP terms of reference, and I'll be happy to take questions on these. Questions for Katie on the TORs for the ERP assessment. Uh, Bob Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've been trying to flip back and forth between the information provided, the meeting materials, and the updates uh, that include the SASC uh, edits. Can you just highlight a few of the key edits that were made? To, that would help me a lot. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so as the we did um, the SAS the, or the work group uh, reviewed these terms of reference at their meeting, and so did make some changes, primarily in order to make sure that. They reflect the work that we will be doing and make it most um, make it most likely that we can succeed at, the, at uh, in completing this term of reference. And so, I think probably the the most important one is um, for number three to develop models um, to estimate population parameters that take into account Atlantic Menhaden's role as a forage fish. So that phrase that take into account Atlantic Menhaden's role as a forage fish um, was taken from number four. I think originally in the document it was something like that take into account environmental drivers. And so I think um, which we had initially put in as it covered some of our models um, very generally, and I think the work group's concern was that we're not focused on every single environmental driver out there. We know what our important role is and that, or that what we care about is Menhaden's role as a forage fish, and so we want to make sure that the models that we develop and what we're judged on um, account for that as kind of the most important um, driver. So rather than this general environmental or ecological drivers term, it's specifically focused on Menhaden's role as a forage fish in developing these models, and it lines it up then better with TOR number four, which is the reference points. And I think we then, and then we sort of tightened up some of these sub bullets under there um, to recognize that the models that we're using for the ERP work group are not um, the traditional sort of statistical catch at age model that was really in mind when we developed the generic terms of reference and that we were covering a much wider range of model types and model structures. And so to make those kind of suggestions about model diagnostics and sensitivity analyses a little more general to apply to a bunch of different types of models in here. Um, and I think, so I think that was the, the most important one, as well as kind of highlighting, trying to look at each model capacity to account for environmental changes as well. John Clark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, Katie, as to how these terms of reference take into account the size of the predator populations, as, as you just mentioned in the roles of forage fish. Yesterday, of course, we had a long discussion about what our striped bass uh, estimates would be coming out of the next assessment, and how does that play into how you will look at the forage fish role of menhaden, depending on the species size of striped bass? 
So uh, that's a good question, and it depends a little bit on what type of model that we end up going with. We are exploring a wide range of types of models, so each model will have sort of its own special characteristics or ways of dealing with that. But I think sort of overall the idea would be that um, less about, so each model sort of takes into account information on those predator species as you describe the past. So we know what happened in the past, and we can say here's how the menhaden population changed, and here's how the striped bass and bluefish populations changed with it. And then going forward, the question becomes how much menhaden should we take and how much should we leave in the water? And that is really related to what are your goals and objectives for those other predator species. So it comes down to, so our models that as we develop those reference points will require us to set target and threshold levels for these other predator species so that we can ensure we are maintaining them, maintaining an appropriate level of menhaden for them. And so I think the plan for the work group is to use what has been established as the targets and thresholds for these predator species um, to say this is how much, if we want to maintain our current target and threshold for these other predator species, here's how much menhaden you need to leave in the ocean and here's how much you can take. I think further on down the road, obviously, this board is going to have to talk to those other boards and establish a relationship and establish kind of a set of shared goals and objectives for all of these species together. But that is something that's going to have to come after the assessment. Uh, Allison Colton. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for the presentation. I think these terms of reference are, are very thorough. Um, I just wanted to build on Bob's comments a little bit, and fortunately this term of reference is repeated in this one, so I got another bite at the apple. Um, but I also re acutely recall some of the issues that we had at the November meeting when discussing the ERP models versus the single species models and some of the issues and um, confusion that there were around the, the differing reference points between the two different approaches. And so um, I really appreciate that that is explicitly included in here as a term of reference to examine those differences. Um, I just want to reiterate again that if there are places where there are natural analogs between the single species and the multi-species models, that those are um, addressed and, and explicit, and then where there are places where there are not direct or natural comparisons between either the model outputs or the reference points between those two different approaches, that there's sufficient narrative and explanation so that um, at least uh, the board can put it in the context of the, the concepts from the single species approach that we're familiar with. Um, I think that'll be really crucial moving forward because, again, uh, if we're to adopt these ERPs, it's an entirely new, different management approach and management strategy. So um, I think that there may be some challenges ahead, and we got some sneak peeks of that last November, um, but I'd really appreciate all the work that you guys could do and as much work as you could put into um, making those connections wherever possible and then thoroughly explaining the differences where they're not possible. Thanks. Yeah, that is absolutely the intent, I think, of the work group is, is making sure that these are sort of presenting a coherent story across both the single species and the ERP um, work group so that you guys can kind of understand these reference points in context with each other and with the historical management of this species. Roy Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Katie, could you refresh our memories as a follow-up to John Clark's question on which suite of predators we're talking about? Um, so we are, we're still sort of in the process of finalizing our which ones will actually go into the model, but we are looking at um, striped bass, spiny dogfish, bluefish, and weakfish as sort of the, the most important predators, um, and we're also considering Atlantic herring as sort of a alternate prey species within this model to kind of understand the trade-offs between those uh, species. John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Madam. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, regarding reference point number four, develop methods to determine reference points and total allowable catch for Atlantic menhaden that account for Atlantic menhaden's role as forage. I think what's missing from that is an explanation of how we intend to use those. Um, and my understanding is they will provide us context. They'll give us a better understanding of what the trade-offs are. But that's not really implicit in any of this. Um, 
I just think maybe it should be made clear somewhere. John, do you feel that TOR 7 captures that to evaluate the stock status from the different models and the reference points? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, to some extent, but I think to the public and to the average Joe, it's, it's, not, it's not terribly clear. I, and maybe it's enough to just put it on the record now um, that that's the intent. And, and uh, that is the intent, if I'm understanding it correctly, to have, to have the information, uh, to understand what the trade-offs are between taking fish out of the water and leaving them in. And then it's really, it's a policy, becomes a policy decision by the board after that. Right. I mean, I would say sort of semi-jokingly, that would be your term of reference is to evaluate these trade-offs and things. And that kind of, I think, where we would provide the information would be, as, as our chair said, number seven, that is providing not just a single estimate of stock status, but a range of estimates of stock status and a range of estimates of um, catch and reference points, but also number eight, to compare the trends in these um, population points, compare the reference points among the proposed um, modeling approaches and explain why they're different, which would include things like um, there's different trade-offs and different um, assumptions that are underlying it. Um, I think if you guys wanted to edit this at all to make it more clear, we, but you could, but I think we recognize that that is the outcome of this. And we did, I think, soften some of the language in here that it's no longer talking about a preferred model, but it's talking about a recommended suite of models, recognizing that there's going to be differences for you to choose among, depending on your management objectives for this species. Are you comfortable with the language, John, with the discussion we've had? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I am. And I, I think there's enough on the record, too, to, to make it very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Are there further questions? Um, Doug Brady. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for this uh, good presentation. Uh, back to, I, I'm just assuming that um, you, you've identified some of the predator species, and then somewhere in here, I guess you'll evaluate, you mentioned, uh, I think, the herring, but you'll evaluate, I guess, the uh, the amount or the percentage of menhaden in the diet of these particular species and other uh, forage species or, or diet uh, species that they they uh, consume. So, I mean, how do you get all that information? And and, how, and what? A, I mean, I know you're working on it, but uh, do you take into account all the other? Uh, things that these fish eat? So, good question. So, the way we evaluate or chose our preferred suite of predators is, number one, we did look at the Northeast Fishery Science Center has an extensive food habits database. So, basically, when they've been doing their trawl all the way back to the 1970s and beyond, they've been taking stomachs as they go of these, both the predators and the prey, and evaluating, basically, what are these animals eating. So, we have information on um, what is an important component of the diet in these stomachs, um, but then we also have information on sort of the abundance of these predators, as well as taking in then into account information. Do we have additional information um, that would support a model of these predators? So um, I think you know, spiny butterfly ray, I think is one of the most, is eats a significant amount of menhaden, but we don't have enough information to really model that, and we don't manage that. So that kind of gets shunted aside in some of these models in favor of other significant predators that we have sufficient data to model and to include and to manage. And so that's kind of how we came up with our suite of predators. And we're also looking at, um, alternate prey species um, such as herring. I think we're also uh, looking at, at scup as another potential um, to kind of evaluate the ability to prey switch and the ability to kind of to trade off between these prey species. But it also depends on the model. So our most complex model would be something like EWE, which would model all of these individual predator-prey relationships, the detrit all the way down from detritus up to whales and things like that, but requires a huge amount of, of effort and input down to our extreme extremely simple um, production models that only model one or two predators. And so we are trying to select a range of predators that's relevant for managers, that's relevant to the biology of the species um, in order to um, 
account for the, the desires of the management board in a way that's biologically meaningful. I hope that helps. Emerson Hasbrook. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just wondering, are there going to be two separate um, peer review panels, one for each approach, or it's the, the same people are going to peer review both? Thank you. The intention is that the same panel will review both of these um, assessments so that they have both of them in front of them to compare. And it will be through a, a CDAR peer review, is that correct, Katie? Uh, yes, that's what I've been told. So it will be a panel comprised of CIE experts. Thank you. Next, I add Colleen Giannini. Thank you, Madam Chair. Katie, I think you kind of touched on it, and I think maybe I just didn't completely understand. Um, I'm thinking about the larger marine mammals that prey on these fish, whales, seals. Is that incorporated? Some, I mean, is that a more data-rich source, or is it incorporated in a different way? So uh, it depends on the model that we're talking about. So we are going forward with several different models for the ERP work group. Um, the EWE models, the EcoPath with EcoSim models, do have the ability to incorporate that into their, um, into their extremely large and complex models. The sort of intermediate com level of complexity models that we're talking about um, represent sort of a trade-off between complexity and data availability. So we have looked at... Um, the Menhaden, is there enough information about, number one, Menhaden consumption by these predators, such as marine mammals or birds? Um, and number two, is there enough information on their, um, on their population size and their population dynamics to be folded into a model explicitly? And so uh, I believe they're incorporated in the EWE context, but in some of our more intermediate and simpler models, they are not because there is not enough information on population total numbers of population on the diet uh, composition on an annual level to be folded into some of these more intermediate complexity models. Uh, John Clark. I'm sorry, John McMurray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colleen actually asked the question I was going to ask, but I would um, take it a little further. And I, I understand the problem with the complexity of including marine mammals as a predator. But was there any effort to do a reasonable estimate? I mean, because just anecdotally, they appear to be the largest predator eating the most menhaden. It would seem that there would be some effort to include that somewhere in here. I mean, like I said, it is included in the EWE um, model that's kind of as a complement or a supporting model to this. And we have looked into the literature in terms of what is available. I mean, as you say, there's kind of the anecdotal perception that they're important. But I think then translating that into not just um, the idea that they're eating a lot, but how has that changed over time? How is that? What is the actual diet composition of their of of those whales and those predators compared to other species that we have more information on. It is, I mean, we recognize that it is a uh, potentially an important um, driver of these, mod of these dynamics, but the data that are available are not comparable to the data that are available on some of our important fin fish predators. So I think when the board, and I think that's something the board is going to have to take into consideration when we, they receive these final numbers is, do these models provide you with the information that you are looking for in terms of what are your management objectives. If your management objectives are to manage for whales and to manage explicitly for um, seals and things like that, then maybe you do want the more complex EWE type models. Um, if you're more focused on the trade-offs between our managed fin fish, then maybe the intermediate complexity is, is sufficient for you. Um, but I think that the assessment will definitely lay out those kinds of trade-offs and those relationships. And, Hopefully we would come to very similar answers, but that is part of where TOR8 comes in, which is there is trade-offs in all of these models um, from both a, a modeling perspective and then from a management perspective. Feels like we're winding down here a little bit on questions, but I did see one more hand from David Blazer, and after that, um, look to the public to see if there are any burning questions about this. I know there's a lot of public interest uh, on this stock assessment. So David, go ahead, please. Yep. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Katie, very complex, and you've got a lot, and your team have a lot to address. Let me just ask one more question. If there's any ability to uh, look at some of the issues that we've dealt with in the last six to nine months in a spatial capacity, 
you know, our folks in the in the Bay are concerned about the interaction between stripers and, and Menhaden. Uh, so I just ask, will that, will that help, anything here help us with those questions? Not, not really. I think that adding the spatial component is um, I, is something we are interested in. We recognize is important, but that's going to be half for the be next benchmark. <laughs> As I, as I said, is there uh, anyone in the public who has a burning desire to ask a question right now? I see one hand. Please uh, come to the microphone and state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Pocket, um, member of the AP, um, recreational angler from Massachusetts. Um, just a question. There is a suite of species that hasn't been mentioned that I didn't read that I just wanted to check on. Up in New England, we believe um, um, that our small pelagic or funny fish fishery, false albacore, Atlantic bonita, and sometimes Spanish mackerel, and actually in the last couple of years, um, king mackerel, are migrating based on abundance of juvenile menhaden, and I'm just wondering if that if that classification of those species are were considered at all, or uh, you know, in the background, I, I don't, I don't imagine they'd be one of the dominant species. But we just want to make sure that 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 seems to be a different time of the year and a different suite of species that make a lot of make a lot of money for our for hire and tourism fleet. So, um, I would say the. We certainly, they did not shake out as a major player in terms of the overall diet composition data, um, which is why they're not included in some of our intermediate complexity models. Our truly complex models, the ecopath, the full-blown ecosystem models, does have the ability to kind of fold those predators in, as well as focusing on a little bit of some of the size class differences of recognizing that they're preying on juvenile menhaden. So there may be the ability to kind of compare some of the output of these models um, from a more of the more moderate complexity to the truly complex models that do take into account those additional predator species. Anyone else in the public? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. And if there are no further questions, uh, we'll look for any changes to the TORs or a motion to approve the TORs for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Ecosystem-Based Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review. Robert Boyles. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make a motion that we approve the uh, uh, these as uh, presented. Is there a second? Uh, Bob Ballou, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? We will call the question then. Um, move to approve the terms of reference for the 2019 Atlantic Menhaden Ecosystem-Based Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Eighteen. Uh, all those opposed, please like sign. Any null votes? Abstentions? The motion carries. Eighteen zero zero zero. And we are on to our last item, which is to review and consider the 2018 fishery management plan review and state compliance reports. Uh, this is an action item. Uh, the FMP review also looks at state compliance with the or state implementation of the amendment three requirements for 2018 um, and Max will start us off with a presentation. Thank you Madam Chair. So this is the 2018 FMP review of the 2017 fishery for Atlantic Menhaden. A uh, quick look at my presentation here. We'll touch on the status of the management plan, status of the stock, status of the fishery, uh, jump into compliance requirements for 2017, and then as uh, our chair pointed out, we'll wrap up with state implementation of Amendment 3 and, and then PRT recommendations. So uh, kind of clear your minds of Amendment 3 and recall that the 2017 fishery was operating under Amendment 2. So the coastwide TAC was distributed solely based on landings from 2009 to 2011. Uh, we had timely reporting requirements in place. The 6,000 pound bycatch allowance was also uh, under Amendment 2. The Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap was set at 87,260 metric tons and uh, that also also include the eligible rollover, so it's a bit higher than that. 
And then 1% uh, of the overall TAC was set aside for the episodic events program. Additionally, Addendum 1 to Amendment 2 allowed two licensed individuals to harvest up to 12,000 pounds of bycatch when working together from the same vessel, fishing stationary, multi-species gear. Okay, so obviously a big management decision was made in 2017, so I'm highlighting that here, Amendment 3. Um, as big as that document was, there was few regulatory changes. Most of it had to do with how that total TAC was allocated to the states. And I'm just highlighting the, the few regulatory changes here. Um, and also highlighting that there was a, a, some strong language in the amendment focusing on the, the want for Menhaden-specific ERPs as soon as they come online. So our state allocation scheme changed. There was a 0.5% fixed minimum, and then the remaining balance is distributed based on 2009 to 2011 landings. Um, the 6,000-pound bycatch provision was changed in the sense that it defined those applicable, applicable gear types, and our Chesapeake Bay reduction fishery cap was reduced to 51,000 metric tons, and the rollover uh, was removed. So this is status of the stock. Recall we had a update last year and our reference points changed slightly with the addition of new years of data. Uh, those new reference point values and definitions are up in the, the table, in the upper left-hand side. Our stock status did not change, we're still not overfished. Overfishing is not occurring. Our stock status figures there on the right should look familiar. And of course, again, two benchmark assessments underway scheduled for review at the end of 2019. So taking a look at the status of the fishery in 2017, our overall TAC was 200,000 metric tons, which is roughly 440.9 million pounds. Our directed harvest, so this is excluding bycatch landings, um, but is including our episodic events set aside landings. That equated to about 378.12 million pounds, which represents 14% underage of the TAC and is 4.7% decrease from our 2016 estimate. Bycatch harvest was estimated at 2.73 million pounds, which is a slight increase from 2016 bycatch landings, and remember that this does not count towards the TAC. Um, another small statistic that it's about on par with what we've seen uh, relative to the whole time series, so no uh, red flags there. I'll get into more about the bycatch later in my presentation. So we combine those two numbers and we have a total harvest of 380.85 million pounds, which is an a 4.6% decrease relative to 2016. Zooming in a little bit on the bait fishery, harvest was estimated 96.62 million pounds. This is a 1.8% increase from 2016, but still below the previous five-year average. New Jersey, Virginia, Maine, Massachusetts, and Maryland landed the largest shares. Looking at the reduction harvest, we have an estimate of 284.2 million pounds. This is a 6.2% decrease from 2016 and 8% below the previous five-year average. Looking at reduction harvest from the Chesapeake Bay, uh, again, the cap was 87,216 metric tons plus the rollover and harvest in 2017 was about 20,000 metric tons, which is below that cap. So this is a figure that everyone should be pretty familiar with, um, showing the uh, trajectories of the different sectors. The two, we have two different axes here. So our reduction landings are on the left axis and in the blue dotted line, um, and it's an order of magnitude larger than our bait landings, which are on the right and in the red. Uh, so again, the take home here is that the reduction uh, 
fishery harvest uh, continues on that downward trend and our bait fishery harvest continues on that upward trend. Again, keeping the magnitude of those landings in perspective. So this is our 2017 bycatch analysis. This is looking at landings that occurred under the 6,000 pound bycatch provision. So once the directed fisheries are closed, states move into this bycatch allowance and that's what we're talking about here. Um, this table is showing number of trips. So a total of 3,387 trips landed Menhaden under the bycatch provision in 2017, uh, which is a large increase relative to 2016, but if you look at the average over the time series, it's, it's about average, actually slightly below. Um, again, majority of these trips landed less than 1,000 pounds. So this is a uh, fairly detailed table. It might be difficult to see up on the screen, but I urge you to look at it in the report. It was in your briefing materials. This is showing average bycatch landings by state and gear type over the 2013 to 2017 period. The predominant gear types here are pound nets and anchored staked gill nets. Maryland, Virginia, PRFC, and New York landed the largest shares of the bycatch. Um, again, no red flags in this table. Uh, the addition of 2017 data, the, the percentages by gear type and by state were about the same. So moving on to the episodic events set aside, uh, this table is showing those landings by year. Uh, and you can see from the table uh, and that third column, the landings column, that the landings have increased each year since 2013. And an average, I'm sorry, an overage did occur in 2017. So we had three participating states, Maine, Rhode Island, and New York. The landings were estimated at 4.69 million pounds and the overage of 285,398 pounds will be deducted from the 2018 set-aside quota. Um, the review team did have some discussions about this continued rise in set-aside landings, but with the new Amendment 3 quotas in place this year, it's kind of hard to anticipate how landings will shake out under this program uh, moving forward, so no recommended management changes at this time. Looking at quota performance, there were two transfers that occurred in 2017, uh, both from North Carolina in the amount of 300,000 pounds to New York and 195,000 pounds to Maine. And this was to address overages in those states. So the final 2017 quotas are listed in that third column and then uh, we had a couple overages in 2017. So Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Delaware had some overages which will be deducted from their 2018 quota on a pound for pound basis. And our updated 2018 quotas are on that last column. Um, this does reflect a tack of 216,000 metric tons, the new Amendment 3 allocations also redistributed relinquished quotas from Delaware, Georgia, and South Carolina. Looking at biological sampling efforts in 2017, uh, no red flags here also, and um, I'll point out a couple things that you, you might have noticed in the report. So with Maine, uh, you'll see Six samples were required, only five were collected, and that's really a result of their sampling protocol where Maine attempts, uh, collects a sample on a weekly basis while the fishery is open. Um, and in 2017, that directed fishery was only open for five weeks. Therefore, they didn't have an opportunity to collect that six sample, and the PRT saw you know, a good faith effort was made to collect those and no issues there. Um, 
somewhat similar situation with Connecticut. There, were, there was a requirement based on their landings totals to collect a sample, a ton fish sample. Unable to do that from their directed fishery. Um, again, I think this is based on the nature of that fishery. It's small volume. Uh, it operates under that 6,000 pound provision year round. And uh, it can be difficult to intercept some of those landings events. So what Connecticut has been doing and has continued to do is c collect biological data from fishery independent sources. The PRT and the technical committee, I believe, weighed in on this previously and determined that that was sufficient to meet this requirement. Um, De minimis, the states of New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida requested de minimis status for the 2018 fishing season. And these states do qualify because they do not have a reduction fishery and their bait landings in the two most recent years did not exceed 1% of the coastwide bait landings. So, uh, with each annual FMP review, we, of course, review the previous fishing season, but we also highlight regulatory changes for the current fishing year, and so that makes a great placeholder for the implementation of Amendment 3. So we recall that implementation plans were due on January 1. They were all received, and states were to implement those provisions by April 1. Um, implementation plans were to include proposed or already implemented regulatory language, which fulfills each of the requirements of Amendment 3. And as I stated before, as big as that document was, there were very few regulatory or compliance related changes in there. A most, most of them were already implemented uh, coastwide. So following review of those implementation plans, the PRT determined that each state has fulfilled the requirements of Amendment 3 with one exception. Virginia's 2018 Chesapeake Bay harvest cap for the reduction fishery is higher than that permitted under Amendment 3. And one other notable comment from the PRT's review, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Georgia uh, don't have any directed fisheries at this time. And so those states have indicated that if a fishery were to develop, they would resubmit implementation plans and demonstrate compliance with the amendment at that time. So regarding PRT recommendations, again, being uh, 2018 being the first year under the new Amendment 3 provisions and new quota allocations, um, it's kind of hard to see how things will fall out with the bycatch provision and with the episodic set aside. But um, with the, so with all that, there's no recommended management changes at this time. The PRT does recommend approving de minimis status for New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And we will need a motion from the board that considers approving the FMP review and state compliance in 2017. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Max. Uh, this is an action item, but let's begin with any questions. Uh, Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Max, are there in the length sampling, age sampling, uh, from the Commonwealth of Virginia, is there any uh, being taken in Chesapeake Bay uh, and the coast to see if there's any difference in what's being harvested between the bay and the coast? I'm not certain of the spatial scale um, there. So the two different fisheries, the bait and the reduction, are sampled separately. I know that. And I know um, it's based on tonnage. I, th I mean, I might look at my science staff to chime in here. I think they know the, the actual data that's collected from that a little bit better than I do. So for the reduction fishery, um, there is the ability to take, to link a set back to its location. So when you take a sample from that final set, we do know whether it's in the bay or whether it's on the coast. And so that is, um, that information is available and does go into the model. I can't say for sure about the bait fishery because that's going to be, that's a different sampling protocol, as Max said. So I would defer to Virginia itself on whether um, that type of information is being collected. Follow up, Richie? 
thank you. <clears throat> um, so is that information that could be provided to the board, I guess, is a the question then? I mean, if the board is interested in seeing that, I would think we could definitely arrange that. It will be part of, I think, the final assessment report, um, that type of information. So do you, when do you want it? We could probably provide it to you at some point. Within the stock assessment is fine. Okay, thank you. Are there additional questions? Seeing none, um, we do have a, a couple items t with this uh, agenda item. Um, the f there, it is an action item. We do need to accept the 2018 FMP review and approve the de minimis requests from New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And then the Chesapeake Bay reduction cap is going to uh, warrant some additional discussion among the board. But let's start with the easy part and um, look to get this document accepted. Uh, Shree Patterson? Yes, I, I would just like to move to approve the de minimis, de minimis status um, for New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And, and would you be willing to include the uh, approval or acceptance of the FMP review in that motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Shree. Is there, is there a second to that motion? Ray Kane, thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, the motion is to accept the 2018 Fishery Management Plan review for Atlantic Menhaden and approve de minimis status for New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 18. Uh, uh, any opposition, please raise your hand. Null votes and abstentions. Uh, the motion carries 18-0-0-0. We have a great record uh, of that. Um, so now we'll move on to the, the trickier part and um, I'll look to the board to have some additional discussion of the Chesapeake Bay cap. Um, as noted, Virginia did not implement the 51,000 metric ton uh, cap for the reduction of fishery in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Steve, Mo Steve Bowman, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just as a matter of record, um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you may or may not know that the Marine Resources Commission, <clears throat> excuse me, does not regulate the uh, Menhaden fishery as far as the uh, adoption of Amendment 3 is concerned. That is left to the General Assembly. This last General Assembly, a bill was introduced, uh, House Bill 1610, by a member of the majority party in the General Assembly uh, that moved to adopt Amendment 3. Uh, it was heavily supported by Governor Northam and Secretary Strickler, who's my supervisor. But at the end of the day, uh, that measure did not pass the General Assembly, which brings us here today. So just for the record, I wanted to let the board know that Governor Northam, Senator, uh, Secretary Strickler, the administration has advanced, uh, along with members of the General Assembly, some uh, this bill uh, in hopes of uh, adopting Amendment 3. But at this present time, we are that they have not uh, chosen to adopt that. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record that the attempt had been made to adopt it. Um, at the present time, it has not been adopted. Thank you. Robert Boyles. Madam Chair, if I could ask Commissioner Bowman a question, um, direct question to Steve. Steve, does that also mean that the Commonwealth is fishing under your old quota, the pre-amendment three quota? That's exactly what that would mean at this time, since there's been no adoption made to Amendment 3. Dennis Abbott. Thank you, Madam Chair. A question for Steve. The bill number 1610, was that brought to a vote before the Assembly, or was it killed in committee, or was it table chair, not tabled, but just pocketed, or how did it work in Virginia? If serve memory serves me correctly, it was initially voted out of the House Ag Committee by one vote. It was re-referred to the House Ag Committee, uh, and then I don't believe there was another vote made on it. So I guess if you can use the term, uh, I don't want to use the term pocketed because that's a 
privilege utilized by the members of the General Assembly, but that's the trail that it took and that's where it is now. Thank you. Roy Miller. Pass. Babalu. Again, if I could, through you, Madam Chair, to, to uh, the Virginia Commissioner. So what are the prospects for uh, having the Virginia legislature uh, circle back to this issue um, in a timely fashion? Thank you. Well, I think the prospects are up to the dialogue that is conducted. Um, furthermore, the Virginia General Assembly is still technically in session because in Virginia, by virtue of the Constitution, we have to pass a balanced budget, and that needs to be done uh, by July. Uh, so this, to answer your question, the General Assembly is subject to recall to consider any uh, motion or any uh, bill that would be provided to them for consideration. Malcolm Rhodes. Um, again, uh, just a question. What is the pre-amendment three cap that the state is uh, operating on currently? It's around 87,000 metric tons, yes, sir. John McMurray. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question for Commissioner Bowman, too. Um, in the presentation, we saw that Virginia was about uh, 20,000 metric tons in 2017, the Bay Harvest. Um, that's way, way below the 87,000 metric ton cap. Is there any reason to believe that it would be at all different this year, that that cap would, would get close to being exceeded or, or met? And that cap hadn't been exceeded in a very long time. Matter, It has not been exceeded, no. Thank you. Chris Bat Savage. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we're concerned about not the uh, the new cap not being implemented uh, in time, and looking at uh, this, you know, through how we've uh, how we look at compliance with other uh, other FMPs, and how we've had to you know make sure that uh, that our, for instance, our Marine Fisheries Commission uh, stayed in compliance with. Uh, you know, the COBIA implementation plans that uh, were just recently passed. Uh, and, yeah, I appreciate, uh, you know, Vir Virginia's efforts to, uh, you know, to try to move this forward uh, as best they can. And I know there's a lot of, it just, it just didn't happen. However, uh, uh, I have a motion uh, that we uh, find the Commonwealth of Virginia out of compliance with Amendment 3 to the Menhaden FMP. Is the motion or, on the board your actually, full motion? Chris? Actually, yeah, I can go ahead and read that one. Move, move the Atlantic Menhaden Board recommend the uh, ISFMP Policy Board that the Commonwealth of Virginia be found out of compliance for not fully and effectively implementing and enforcing Amendment 3 to the Atlantic Menhaden <clears throat> Fishery Management Plan. If the state does not implement the following measures from Section 4.3.7, Chesapeake Bay Reduction Fishery Cap, of Amendment 3, the annual total allowable harvest from the Chesapeake Bay by the reduction fishery is limited to no more than 51,000 metric tons. Is there a second to the motion? Jim Estes. Uh, discussion on the motion, please. Bob Blue. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, either to you or through you to our executive director, uh, I just would be uh, interested in being reminded of the process that would follow if this motion were to not only pass this board but also be approved by the policy board what would be the uh, sequence of events that would follow and in particular i'm interested in whether that would afford the virginia legislature the opportunity to come into compliance uh, prior to anything being sent uh, up uh, to a higher level i'll go ahead please Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if the policy board agrees with this motion, then it actually gets forwarded to the full commission. So it'd be three votes. But if the full commission agreed that the state was out of compliance, um, that triggers a clock of 10 business days for me to send a letter to the Secretary of Commerce uh, notifying of the non-compliance finding by the commission. Once the secretary receives that letter, um, Secretary Ross would have 30 days to make a determination whether 
uh, he does or does not concur with the Commission's findings. Um, his finding is based on two questions. One, does the state or did the state implement regulations consistent with the with uh, interstate FMP? And that that's a pretty direct yes or no question. Um, then, then the second question would be, does the lack of implementation of the provisions um, included in our non-compliance finding have a conservation impact on that stock? So that's a, a, a judgment area by the Secretary of Commerce. Um, and the, so there's 30 days for him to make that determination. If um, the secretary does agree the state's out of com compliance, the secretary has 60 days, or I'm sorry, six months to implement a moratorium. So um, the, you know, you've got a 30-day period while, while the decision is made, and then six-month discretionary window on when a moratorium could start. So, you know, does that allow Virginia to come back into compliance? I think is your second part of that. It, you know, it, it, there is. There is a series of timed steps there that have to happen, um, but you know I'm not sure if that would or would not uh, provide sufficient time for Virginia to come back into compliance. Uh, Adam Nowalski. Keeping in mind a recent finding by the Secretary of Commerce, does the Commission feel that it can make a compelling argument to the Secretary of Commerce that this regulation is needed for the conservation of the resource. Uh, I'll look to Robert Boyles, please. Madam Chair, if I may, I, let me take a swing at that. Um, I pulled up the uh, U.S. Code and would remind you of the 1993 um, Atlantic Coastal Cooperative Cooperative Fisheries Management Act. Finding of the U.S. Congress, Section 5101 of the U.S. Code, the failure by one or more Atlantic states to fully implement a coastal fishery management plan can affect the status of Atlantic coastal fisheries. And I'd like to add emphasis here, ma'am, madam and can discourage other states from fully implementing coastal fishery management plans. I'll speak for myself and say I'm discouraged. Um, we have embarked on this action and it took a long time to bring us to Baltimore. And I went back and I looked and um, it was a strong vote to approve Amendment 3, 17 to 1, I believe. Um, so I'm discouraged. Um, I think, um, if I may, Adam, to, to get back to your question, um, I think we can make a strong case that we really want compliance here. We, the law requires compliance. Um, but I just, and I saw an opening and I saw the words discouraged. And I think part of we of what we need to keep in mind here is that, um, as uh, y'all know, I like to quote Dr. Franklin, who said, we shall, um, if we don't all hang together, we will certainly hang individually. Thank you. Pat Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, um, I appreciate uh, Robert Boyle's words. Um, I certainly also appreciate uh, that the Commonwealth of Virginia has continued to try to make good faith efforts to come into compliance. Uh, and because of that good faith effort, uh, I would like to uh, move to postpone. Um, and I've sent um, some language down uh, to to Tony. I'm not sure if she got it, but uh, she, I don't see it. There it is. Um, I would move to postpone to the August Commission meeting week uh, and in the interim send a letter to the Commonwealth of Virginia detailing the contents of the, the postponed motion. And if I get a second, I'll give further justification. A uh, second from David Borden. Uh, continue, Pat. Um, thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, the Virginia General Assembly uh, is still indeed in session and have not uh, gone into recess uh, since Dai. And with an opportunity to, to correct the Commonwealth's uh, status uh, or statutes from Menhaden, uh, that would 
they have the opportunity to uh, to correct those statutes, and they would have the ability to come back into compliance uh, if we give them uh, this delay. It's also my understanding that Virginia has, as I said earlier, made a, a very good faith effort uh, to come into a compliance. Uh, they will continue to hopefully do so, uh, and based on the uh, comments from Steve Bowen, I, I believe that is the case. Fisheries just getting started. Um, we have not reached, we, they've not had an opportunity to even start fishing on this uh, 51,000 metric tons uh, for the bay cap. And I think, uh, again, um, th th this would be in the spirit of uh, Robert Boyle's comments uh, to make sure that we're all working cooperatively here and have an opportunity to come back into compliance as a body. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, we have a, a motion to postpone to a definite time, which is a debatable motion. So I'll look to the board for uh, further discussion of this. Steve Train. Thank you. I, I hate to go against uh, Pat on something, so I need an answer from Virginia if possible, because the last thing I want to do is ever tie up fishing boats and a healthy resource. What is the likelihood that the 51,000 metric ton allowance would be exceeded if this is not, if Amendment 3 has not been implemented um, in a timely fashion before we get back in August? Is there any guess probability? I think the historical numbers would show that it would, it has been six, six years six years since that 51,000 metric tons been exceeded and I think it would take longer than August in all likelihood to exceed that 51,000 metric tons. With that answer I have a comfort level with the postponement. Dennis Abbott. Thank you Madam Chair. As you probably all know I'm a very black and white person in that it's either right or it's wrong, or I don't f sometimes find myself going to the middle ground. However, I think that this issue goes beyond even th the issue of noncompliance with Virginia. It really goes to the health of this organization. So therefore, I think I'd, I not think I will support the motion to postpone because I think that's where, where we should go at this point in time. Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I think I reflect a lot or agree with a lot of the comments said. I would just add that, um, you know, based upon the history of harvest in that cap and, and you know, the concern of, of maybe, uh, you know, damage to the resource, the harvest has been so low and it, it is a healthy stock. And on top of that, I think, um, you know, I, I share Robert's comments about, you know, we are concerned. This is something that is serious and it's what we're here for. But we got to recognize and, and re deference to, new, to Virginia that they do have a new administration and they're just um, sort of getting their act together in some respects as most administrations do. So I think um, in the spirit of cooperation, you know, giving them that extra time to consider this I think is appropriate at this time. So I support the motion. Chris Batsavage. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, there's certainly some unique circumstances with this particular uh, compliance issue, especially where Virginia's General Assembly manages the Menhaden fishery as opposed to the state agency. Um, I guess the question I have is uh, if, if, we, if this motion passes, are we setting precedent for other uh, instances where states uh, don't implement uh, compliance measures? Uh, by, by a certain date. I know there's been, there's sometimes we have to give states a little extra time if they give us uh, advance notice, but are, are we setting a precedent here, like, you know, for, say, our recreational fisheries that we often uh, have to uh, implement measures on an annual ba basis? Thanks. Uh, I, too, remember a number of times that we've given some leeway to states to implement measures when they have difficulties with legislature or other timing of regulations, um, and I don't know if I see staff nodding their head to some degree. Um, so I don't know, I don't believe this would be a precedent setting action. I see Tony Kearns nodding her head. Um, I saw Richie White now. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
<clears throat> I, I as well will support this motion. Um, I think it also um, allows omega protein uh, to c show good faith uh, with this commission uh, and not actively pursue catching the bay cap. So I think it, it gives them a chance to show they want to work with the commission to <clears throat> allow proper regulations to come into effect. Thank you. Tom Fody. Being recipient over the years of when we used to do striped bass by legislation instead of um, as we can do it now, there was many times, one time, because the state house flooded and we couldn't get in for a vote, we had to have a special meeting about Senate to actually get a striped bass. So I understand the problem, and the, the um, commission has always been sympathetic to those situations. So I guess I have to be understanding for Virginia, too. David Borden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I totally agree with many of the provisions that, and points that Robert made. Uh, on this issue, but I seconded this. Um, being mindful of the question that Chris asked about have we done this before, and I just remind everybody that about six months ago we did this, or maybe less, we did this with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where they, they had not adopted a mesh size regulation, and we basically allowed them three months to bring their regulations into compliance, and they did. So hopefully we'll get the same result. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder, David. <laughs> John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I certainly understand the concern about precedent, but as we've heard from a practical perspective, it's very unlikely that that 51,000 metric ton cap is going to be exceeded. Um, but I guess my question is, what, what's the plan for Virginia? Is the legislature even in session to deal with this? Is there a game plan? I wouldn't consider it a game plan. I don't want to use the term game. It's a plan. Uh, and that would be that should this uh, August board decide to uh, adopt the motion, uh, we would then distribute the letter outlining the concerns to the legislature and explain thoroughly uh, during the course of the dissemination what the ramifications are, again, for not uh, coming into compliance with Amendment 3. Thank you. Doug Brady. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. So uh, we should assume that, that um, the legislature has until July 1 to pass a bill. If nothing happens uh, to, up to the July 1, it's, it's a moot point because after that the legislature has adjourned for the year and we know where we're headed. Can we assume that? that one could assume that, but the General Assembly in the Commonwealth of Virginia is always subject to recall by the Governor of the Commonwealth. Any additional comments from the board? Uh, is there anyone in the public who would like to address the motion to postpone? Seeing none, are we ready to call the question? Is there a need to caucus? Seems pretty quiet, so we'll go ahead. Um, the motion is to postpone to the August Commission meeting week and in the interim send a letter to the Commonwealth of Virginia detailing the contents of the postponed motion. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Uh, those opposed, like sign. Null votes and abstentions, two. The motion carries 16-0-0-2. We are down to other business. Is there any other business to bring before the board? Dennis Abbott. I note in our document paperwork in front of us that we do not have a vice chair. Are you planning to have a vice chair or are you going to handle it all by yourself for two years? 
I would love a vice chair, but um, uh, Max has advised that we'll take care of that at the next board meeting. Thank you. <laughs> Any other business to come before the board? If not, uh, we will adjourn the meeting. Um, lunch is served or is provided to commissioners and board members. Um, it's out in the hallway at a 1230. I don't know if it's, is it ready yet, Laura? It may be ready, maybe not, but it's, it's uh, in the next few minutes it should be ready.